I'll start this video with the obligatory spoiler warning. Outer Wilds is an unforgettable game that not enough people have played and that you should experience for yourself. If you haven't, know that I'm about to spoil the whole thing, so feel free to clock out now while you still can. However, I bet most of you are here because as fans, you are looking for another excuse to dive back in. I mean, I know the feeling there is something irresistible drawing people back into this marvelous little game. And I say little in the best possible way. In fact, it's what I'd like to talk about here. The ways in which Outer Wilds plays with scale. Size doesn't matter, they say, but not so often in the context of video games. I'll let Todd Howard of Bethesda do the heavy lifting here. And if you've played our previous stuff, you know that mountain is not just a backdrop. You can walk all the way to the top of that mountain. And it's a huge world. We love it when the size of a game is overwhelming. We compare the size of Breath of the Wild's Hyrule to that of Skyrim. We marvel at the diversity of the biomes in Forza Horizon 5 and we stake out every last tower in Assassin's Creed or Far Cry. And before I talk about Outer Wilds, I should talk about No Man's Sky. For the unfamiliar, No Man's Sky is an exploration slash survival game in which players traverse a procedurally generated open world universe, which includes over 18 quintillion planets. A universe-size sandbox, as lead developer Sean Murray announced it at E3 back in 2014. This universe that we've created, it's, it's so vast, it's so boundless, it's actually infinite. And we don't even know what's out there. The hype surrounding this game when it was announced was fascinating. Murray's team had created something that exceeded even their own imagination. One year later, at the next big demonstration, Murray zoomed out the camera to demonstrate the size of his procedurally generated universe to an audibly excited audience. With a flair for the dramatic, he pondered. Now most of these places have never been visited. Many of them never will be. There was something very convincing about Murray's presentations. His boyish excitement while zooming out towards algorithmic infinity. The whole thing was essentially about the sublime, which is a concept that comes up a lot in games research. And that makes sense, given the attempts of many games to awe their players. Like when you leave the dimly lit starting cave in which you begin games like Fallout or Breath of the Wild and see the world stretch out before you for the first time. In Murray's presentation, a particular version of the sublime comes to mind. The mathematical sublime. It was introduced by Immanuel Kant, and it's all about the human power of reason. Kant noted that we get this feeling when we are confronted with something that is so large that we can reason about it, but we cannot properly imagine it. An algorithmic system that produces 18 quintillion planets might be something we can logically express, but it overwhelms our imaginary capacity. This focus on the human power of reason is the bedrock for what later would be called the technological sublime. Where Kant was mostly concerned with the sublime as having a natural cause, modern people conceive of the cosmos as equally dauntingly vast, but now because we view it through mathematics, computer science, genetics and quantum mechanics. A daunting quantitative ensemble of permutation and probability. Murray's creation, like many science fiction works before it, is built on this aesthetic mode. The second thing Murray's presentation made me think of is Jorge Luis Borges' 1946 short story called On Exactitude in Science. It's a one paragraph tale about an empire whose maps were so precise they were exactly as big as the territory they represented. It seems that Murray and his team wanted to algorithmically build a model that would be close to an actual stand-in for the universe. Of course, that is not to say that all of these games don't still compress their spaces for all kinds of rhetorical or stylistic purposes. 
mountains in Breath of the Wild, spectacular as they look from a distance, can be climbed in minutes. The version of Mexico in Forza Horizon 5 is a series of highlights summing up to around 107 square kilometers, and No Man's Sky allows you to move between galaxies in seconds. None of this is intended as a knock against these games. What I'm trying to say is that Outer Wilds is special because it pushes this tension to its logical extreme. It captures this sense of awe while simultaneously being set in what can only be described as a toy solar system, where distances are measured in kilometers and spaceships are coupled together with wooden planks. How does this game make that strange combination of miniature and magnitude work so well? Let's start with one of the game's most memorable moments. You figure out how to warp to the sun station, that little speck you've seen circling around the sun. You open the safety hatch, falls away, and beneath you, there it is. In this moment, the sun feels massive, even though you can literally see its curvature. Of course, the music and sound effects do a lot of work here, but I think there's more to it. The dramatic sense of scale also has to do with the player projecting their own scale of things onto this imaginary one. The sun is enormous, even if it is a model. Outer Wilds is essentially a compilation of similar sublime moments, from tornado-filled oceans to black holes looming at the center of a crumbling planet, to desolate thorn-filled caverns that stretch further and further the deeper you venture in. All of them scaled down while also remaining, on some level, unfathomable. Alex Beecham, the creative director of Outer Wilds, has often repeated the inspiration his team took away from The Legend of Zelda. This makes sense given how the original NES game was envisioned. Shigeru Miyamoto once mentioned how he viewed Zelda as a miniature garden that you can put into a drawer and revisit anytime you like. A sort of playable diorama. And if you've ever stood in front of a good diorama, you'll know, stare long enough and it will come to seem real. It's that design philosophy that Outer Wilds takes to its logical extreme, dropping the player into a miniature solar system. The entire game acts as a metonym, a deliberately small map standing in for one of the biggest possible territories. Instead of producing some form of dissonance, which game scholars love talking about, that tension is immensely productive. Take the player's home planet, Timber Hearth. It has maybe two dozen people on it in one little village, consisting of a handful of houses who all know each other by name. The Nomai similarly seem to consist of around 30 individuals, and the same goes for the strangers' inhabitants. At the same time, these are spacefaring races that have developed appropriate technology. The game never really resolves the tension between these scales. Time is similarly squashed together in some cases, the entire universe dies out in about 20 minutes, but remains uncompressed in others. For instance, players learn that the Nomai arrived and died in their solar system hundreds of thousands of years ago, and that time frame significantly adds to the sense of scale and tragedy. It also enables the game to convincingly explore narratives such as this species destroyed their home planet while creating a ring world and travel the galaxy. Outer Wilds is a model, but not all the time. The game uses a metaphor to bridge this gap between the minute and the humongous. Space travel as camping in the woods. There's a quirkiness to the Harthians, roasting marshmallows in the forest, and a DIY-ness to their scientific ambitions, all accompanied by this quaint banjo lad soundtrack. These moments, scattered throughout the game, give it a distinct warmth, lighting up the coldness of space and the icy synthesizers typically used to represent it. But then again, there are moments. For every cozy second of reprieve, there is the relentlessness of space that comes right after it. 
player character is called Hatchling by the NPCs, and the game makes you feel like one. Half of the time, you walk around with all kinds of false assumptions about what's going on or what you need to do next. Outer Wilds physics are an unusually uncompromising simulation. It's hard to navigate your spaceship around. You're constantly bumping against walls or clumsily flying into objects. Gravity is relentless and about to kill you at any moment. And kill you at will. The shifting sands, the falling rocks, the currents and the creaking of your ship as it gets swallowed by a space fish. Everyone I've seen playing Outer Wilds had a different hang-up about a certain planet. My sister hated the claustrophobic caverns of Amber Twin. One of my friends avoided going back to Giant's Deep after he'd plunged headfirst into it on his first trip. And yet, at the same time, part of the grotesque fun in Outer Wilds comes from dying in many different ways. The game even hands out achievements for it. You're squashed by rising sand, you fly into the sun because your autopilot doesn't work as you expected, you're smashed onto the ground after an island is hurled into space by a tornado. And all of this from a first-person view, with the hud of your spacesuit flickering and the sound of your cracking bones or burned skin, it is intensely physical. because of this stylistic incoherence that I never really knew what I was playing. It's hard to find your footing in a genre or a style here. It's both mellow and frightening, relaxed and disconcerting, and those experiences bleed into one another. There's a lot of confusion and panic as the loop might almost be over, and there's also a playfulness which comes from knowing you can do it again. The time loop in Outer Wilds forces the player to quickly come to grips with and reflect on the grandest thing of all. Every 22 minutes you get to witness the end of life as you know it. The song that announces that there are about two minutes left is preceded by a low hum that, after so many loops, becomes an instantly recognizable source for either urgency or resignation, and that then blossoms into that somber, but stately motif for the end of the loop. It's that constant repetition that takes us back to the sublime. Not so much the mathematical kind, but rather what Edmund Burke called the artificial infinite. A suggestion of infinity or boundlessness that occurs when one is confronted with uniform repetition. Burke talks about sounds, about being struck by a strong pulse of air repeatedly, causing the expectation of another one. It is that succession and uniformity of blows that, as Burke notes, impress the imagination with an idea of their progress beyond their actual limits. In other words, it's not just the scale of that giant explosion engulfing you every 22 minutes, but also the expectancy of it happening that triggers a sense of the sublime. But then, there are also small details disrupting the repetitiveness. After each supernova, the player begins a new loop, staring up at the sky, and seeing the mechanistic clockwork of the orbital probe cannon above that, like all the planets in the loop, seems to be doing the exact same thing. But it isn't. After a few loops, the attentive player notices that the cannon is firing in a different direction each time. There is a little crack in the uniformity, and finding out why this happens amounts to one of the game's central revelations, ultimately leading the player to the game's end.
So you grab the core from the Ash Twin project, the music stopping as you exit to your spacecraft. You go through the rush and the stress of making it past the scariest part of the game with a time limit, now flanked by the end of the world song, kicked up to anthemic proportions. You make it to the spaceship, you enter the coordinates, and you're gone. Everything goes quiet. Standing around in the Nomai spaceship, you see your own solar system blink out from a vast distance. Unspectacular, almost indifferently, like all the other solar systems you've seen collapsing. <gasps> There's that cathartic quantum storm, and then the game's ending. And I want to talk about that ending for a second, because it too is all about scale. At the end of their journey, the player ends in a fantasy-like quantum version of the observatory's museum they started off in. It's a building with two purposes, observing and explaining. It looks both forward and backward, conserving current knowledge while attaining new knowledge. The end of Interstellar comes to mind here, which also involves this conservatory experience at the end of the journey, and which also seeks profundity by allowing the protagonist to look back at what ultimately turned out to be the fate of their species. Whatever it was upside down. Well, my dad was a farmer, um, like everybody else back then. In Outer Wilds, players also get to look back on their friends, and they do so with the help of their signal scope, the tool they used throughout the game to orient themselves in the model and to find their friends camping across the solar system. Here, these friends become archetypes for dealing with the scope of the devastation around them. One builds a house to protect himself. The house then crumbles. One floats above it all, writing poetry in his hammock. One searches for scientific knowledge, circling around the sun like a planet himself, as though he's taking photos from every possible angle. One is addicted to adventure among perilous and mysterious creatures. One represents the fear of death, always looming behind you. And one remains courageously optimistic in their pursuit for knowledge. You walk up and see skeletons of Nomai pointing at the sky. When you look back down, they have begun building a tower with their own bodies. Each time you look, the tower grows taller, until eventually, again through physical metaphor, the bones of the Nomai become the spaceship. Bones aren't a metaphor here for tools or weapons, as they were elsewhere. Here, they represent the physical stakes of the pursuit for knowledge. The same stakes you have experienced firsthand all this time. Outer Wilds is decidedly optimistic about the power of technology, about the curiosity inherent to the scientific method. But it's not technology for its own sake. In fact, here at the end, technology ultimately leads to a sense of the divine, to some higher power deciding over life and death that you just have to accept. The Nomai represent both technological skill and, through their deaths, a sense of cosmic insignificance. Some things are simply too big to control. In other words, technology alone is not enough. It's after all in musical harmony that these friends and perspectives bring a new universe into existence. Earlier in the game, the player could get the harmonic convergence achievement by listening to their friends play simultaneously from a distance. This term, harmonic convergence, comes from the world's first synchronized global peace meditation in August 1987, which coincided with an exceptional alignment of planets in the solar system. The concept of harmony in astronomy goes back a long time. The old Greeks, for instance, came up with the idea of musica universalis, music of the spheres, where the movements of celestial bodies all emit their own unique sound. Again, in Outer Wilds, all that grandeur is pared back. It's about individual people and their little instruments. 
instead of heroically saving everything, you get to influence what comes after you with your own experience and personhood. The smallest scale of the individual influences the largest possible scale of the universe itself. In the end, I think that is a very hopeful way of thinking about our own sphere of influence in the face of humanity's future. of this video I spoke about No Man's Sky. In a way, that game is more like the real world. It is random. Its universe is a collection of parameters with more or less interesting permutations in which you screw around until you find something that you want to stick around for. Sometimes things are boring, sometimes they're interesting. Outer Wilds, on the other hand, is a puzzle box. It offers a curated reality and it applies the semiotics of the obvious, where anything that looks suspicious probably is important. The joy of Outer Wilds is found in connecting the dots laid out on the map before you. And as you do, the experience becomes one of living inside that model. To me, the vastness of all the hyper-objects in Outer Wilds, planets and stars and the end of the universe itself, was only really revealed after I was done playing. When I sat there in my bedroom with the controller on my lap and glanced at the night sky through my window. Instead of marveling at the power of our algorithms to build a universe, Outer Wilds let me marvel at the scale of it all because it was represented as so clearly compressed, so clearly handcrafted. In doing so, I think the game shows us something central to the particularity of inhabiting a model. Something that's both overwhelming and manageable in its predictability. Something that oscillates between control and surrender. We're both being thrown around in the model and overseeing it. We're both in the dream and outside of it. As far as I'm concerned, this kind of immersive experience of scale points to the ways in which video games can innovate in the genre of science fiction. Film scholar Scott Bucatman has pointed out that, and I quote, The precise function of science fiction, in many ways, is to create the boundless and infinite stuff of the sublime experience. Outer Wilds illustrates the grandeur of time and space by shrinking them down and, now and then, letting the true scale of things escape from the model. I think it's because of this beautiful confusion of scales that Outer Wilds is so hard to let go of. I still sometimes browse through Let's Play videos just to look at the reactions of people in the comments who all seem to want to go back. Back to the beginning of the loop, when things didn't make sense yet. When the possibilities hadn't collapsed. And the full scale of things was yet to be understood. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I would appreciate it if you could leave a like or a comment or subscribe. That would all help out a ton. I know there is a lot that I didn't cover about this game. And one thing in particular that I think is interesting in the context of the sublime is that of terror. And that is, of course, something that becomes really evident in the DLC for Outer Wild. So hopefully see you all in a video about that.